and welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases and UK true crime. Today, and for the next couple of episodes, we are going to be delving deep into the case of the so-called Bible John murders that took place in Glasgow during the late 1960s. A string of unsolved murders rocked the city, and to this day, the perpetrator behind them has not been identified, and the murders remain unsolved. It's one of the most notorious unsolved cases in UK history, and in these episodes, I hope to explore the lives of the female victims in these senseless murders, and hopefully give them their voice back. For many years, Bible John has been the main focus of the narrative, and while who did it is important, who the victims were are just, if not, more important. This episode contains descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. Glasgow is located on the River Clyde and is Scotland's most populated city. It has always had an important and prominent place in Scottish history, and during the Industrial Revolution its population grew rapidly. Glasgow was known for its production of chemicals, textiles and important machinery for the shipbuilding and marine industries. It gained prominence during the Victorian era and many people flocked there to earn a living and learn a trade. The population of the city soared and during the 19th century, Glasgow became one of the first cities in Europe to reach a population of more than a million. This rapid boom in the population meant that more houses and residential buildings had to be built. They sprung up all over the city, which alleviated the problem somewhat, however the effects of both World War I and II could not be underestimated. Glasgow was hit hard by aerial bombing from Germany's Luftwaffe, and many parts of the city were damaged by the attacks. Like many other parts of the world after World War II, it took Glasgow a while to recover from this, and during the 1950s, an attempt was made to try and improve conditions for the residents. By the 1960s, however, many other problems began to surface. The city was suffering from economic decline, brought on by a period of deindustrialization. The disappearing industries employed a lot of people in the city, and it meant that it was also hit by very high unemployment. The conditions that many of the residents lived in was a huge issue. The housing that had sprung up after the population boom during the 19th century was still being used during the 1960s. Many of these houses and flats weren't fit for purpose. Residents lived in overcrowded conditions, and in some cases, without running water, electricity, or even windows. Many people were suffering with health conditions as a result of their living situations, and families were struggling to get by, particularly with the loss of local jobs. The 1960s were difficult for many people living in Glasgow. And while there was a regeneration happening, with many of the slums and damaged buildings being pulled down, many people were still living in untenable situations. Disused and bombed pieces of land, as well as abandoned buildings, were commonplace, and unfortunately for many children, there was nowhere else for them to play. Many of these abandoned areas of land became playgrounds for the many residents in the area. While Glasgow is nothing like this today, this was the reality for many in the 1960s. Thursday the 22nd of February 1968 was like any other normal day for many of the residents of Glasgow. 25-year-old Patricia Docker was an auxiliary nurse and worked at Mearns Kirk Hospital in the town of Newton Mearns. The town is located around seven miles from the city of Glasgow. Patricia had moved back to live with her parents in Langside Place in the south of the city. She was married to her husband Alex, who worked in the Royal Air Force, and they had a four-year-old son also called Alex. Alex Sr. was stationed in Lincolnshire with the Air Force, and it appeared that Patricia and Alex's marriage was having some problems, however the extent of this is unknown. Unknown. 
Patricia was back in Glasgow and by all accounts was working hard in her job as a nurse and taking good care of her son. As a working mother who often had long shifts, she didn't get much time to herself and nights out were few and far between. So on that Thursday the 22nd of February, she had decided that she was going to have a night out and visit one of the local ballrooms. She got dressed up and put on her best clothes, a yellow woolen mini dress, brown shoes and a brown handbag along with a watch. February in Glasgow was cold and it had been frosty, so Patricia put on a warm grey duffel coat on top of her outfit and headed out. She had told her parents that she was going to the Majestic Ballroom, a well-known dance hall in the city centre. She was heading out by herself that evening and they were happy in the knowledge that she was going somewhere like the Majestic. This reassurance would soon turn into fear and concern the next morning when her parents realised that she hadn't returned from the night before. Initially, they believed that Patricia must have gone to stay with a friend and would be back later on. This didn't happen, and by the afternoon her parents had significant worries. It was at this point that the local residents close to Langside Place were learning some disturbing news. A woman's body had been found in Carmichael Lane, which was located just yards from Langside Place where Patricia lived with her parents. Morris Goodman discovered her body as he was on his way to his car, which he kept in a lock-up garage on the lane. The scene on that Friday morning must have been alarming. The woman was naked and appeared to have been stripped of her belongings. She had injuries to her head and her face and clear ligature marks could be seen around her neck as though she'd been strangled with something. Police had been called to the scene and local residents began to clamour to see what had happened and what had been discovered. Detective Sergeant Andrew Johnston and Detective Constable Norman MacDonald attended the scene and began to examine it thoroughly. DC Norman MacDonald later recalled, as recorded in the Herald, There had been a heavy frost that night. We arrived about 8.10am and stopped the car at the Overdale Street end of the lane. The body was lying with the head towards us. Initially I thought it was a man because of the thin build, but when I got closer I could see it was female. She was completely naked and there was no sign of her clothing. She was lying on her back with the head turned to the right. The body was that of Patricia Docker. It was significant that nothing else had been found at the scene, including her clothes, handbag and watch and police began to fan out to check if they could locate any of her belongings. Were they dealing with robbery as the motive, or was this a sexual attack? It wasn't clear from the scene, and so Patricia's body was sent for a post-mortem. It was found that her cause of death was strangulation, and from close inspection of the markings around her neck, it was speculated that she may have been strangled with a belt. She also had injuries which suggested she may have been punched or kicked, however these were not life-threatening. There was no clear indication that she had been sexually assaulted, however police believed that this was probably likely. Dr James Imrie, a police pathologist who had examined Patricia's body at the scene, explained that due to the rigor mortis that he observed, she was probably killed in the late evening or early hours of the morning. Officers who were searching the scene eventually found the casing for Patricia's watch in a puddle, not far from her body, and when trawling the river car, they recovered her handbag. The river was not far from the scene, and it appeared that the perpetrator had discarded these items, perhaps en route from the scene, or even in a deliberate act. If it was a deliberate act, it implied that whoever had committed this knew the area well. The other thing that stood out to investigators was that all of Patricia's other belongings were missing, including all of her clothes. Where had these gone? Had the offender taken them when they left the scene? The fact that she had been left naked and no attempt had been made to cover up her body was also alarming, and police attempted to try and narrow down some suspects. (laughs) 
This episode is sponsored by Podcorn, a marketplace which connects podcasters to amazing podcast sponsorship opportunities like host read ads, interview segments, topical discussions, and lots more. I have been using Podcorn for a couple of years now and I have loved every minute of it. The platform is so easy to use and you can browse hundreds of sponsorship opportunities to find the right one for you. I have worked with many diverse brands and products and found loads of new things to try. The thing that I love the most is that you have complete control over the sponsorships and adverts that appear on your podcast. Podcorn ensures that the podcaster has full creative control and freedom and is compensated fairly for the work that they do. I can honestly say that I have felt respected and valued throughout the whole process and it's quick and easy to get going with. Get started now with Podcorn by browsing the sponsorship opportunities using the link in the show notes. I want to tell you all about a new true crime podcast that I've been listening to. Eastern Crime Zone is a fantastic podcast which highlights lesser known cases that need more coverage. This is something that I know many of you will be interested in, considering that this is also the main goal here at The Unseen. Each week, Cassie takes you through a new case. Some of these are recent cases, like a breakdown of the disappearance of Daniel Robinson, to a case from the 1920s in LA. One episode I want to really highlight is the one that I've recently listened to about the murder of Erica Alonso. Cassie worked with Erica's family to highlight this case, and it's one that definitely needs more coverage. I know that many of you will be really interested in finding out more about Eastern Crime Zone, and so find it wherever you listen to podcasts. And also find Cassie and the podcast on social media at Eastern Crime Zone on Instagram and ECZPod on Twitter. You can also find the link in the show notes. Patricia's father, John, eventually got wind of what had been found, and someone who knew Patricia put them in contact with the police. Patricia's family received the news that they had been hoping that they would never receive. Her family were horrified and devastated by the news of the murder, and moreover, had to try and be strong for Patricia's son, Alex. They couldn't understand how such a thing had happened to her just yards away from her home. The events of that previous evening and the early hours of the morning were now of utmost importance. They immediately conducted a door-to-door investigation, asking anyone in the area if they had seen or heard anything suspicious the previous evening. The majority of people didn't have any information, however one witness did provide an interesting line of inquiry. The witness told police that the previous evening they had heard a woman scream, Leave me alone! This piece of information was important to the investigation, but unfortunately they didn't have a lot more to go on, and so her movements on the evening before were even more crucial. Detectives had to figure out where she had been and who she might have been with. Her parents provided the information that they knew. She was heading alone to the Majestic Ballroom and intended to be home afterwards. While Patricia had told her parents this, it was not actually what happened. After heading to the Majestic, Patricia had actually left and headed to another location, the Barrowland Ballroom. The Barrowland Ballroom is located in the east of Glasgow and was built in 1934. The area was, and still is, known for the Barras, a shopping street and indoor market in the east end of the city. The Barras came about during the 1920s, when the founder of the market, Maggie McIver, and her husband James, decided to allow around 300 local traders to set themselves up on a piece of land that the couple owned. Local traders were struggling to sell on the city streets, and this arrangement meant that everyone could be involved and make money. They also hired out carts and horses to traders, many of which were women and it thrived under Maggie's management. She had a great relationship with many of the traders, and she was widely respected. She was known for putting on large Christmas dinners for the traders at the Barras, 
and they would hire a local hall each year for the event. One Christmas in the 1930s, however, they were unable to hire out a hall, and it was then that Maggie decided that she would build her own to suit their needs. The idea for the Barrowland Ballroom came about, and by Christmas Day 1934, the ballroom was built above the indoor market. This was a solution to the problem, and also helped Maggie raise more income. Her husband James had since died of malaria, and she'd been left to raise nine children, and so needed to come up with some new revenue streams. It was a huge success, and soon became the go-to place for many people in the city. Maggie McIver died in 1958, and by the time of her death, not only had she helped people get started, but she was also a multi-millionaire. She was a key part of Glasgow's history, and was one of 12 Scottish people to be commemorated by Historic Environment Scotland. A plaque was placed outside the Barrowlands Ballroom to remember her. The original building that Maggie constructed, however, was not the building that existed during the 1960s. In 1958, the same year that she died, the building was destroyed by a fire and was subsequently rebuilt. The ballroom reopened in 1960 and continued to be a popular venue in the city. By the time that Patricia Docker attended the ballroom in 1968, however, it had gained a somewhat different reputation. While ballrooms like the Majestic were seen as reputable places to visit, the Barrowlands had gained a reputation as a rougher establishment, where men and women would go to pick up dates. It had more of a seedy reputation and was not somewhere that everyone would admit that they frequented. It has been reported that Thursday nights, the night that Patricia visited, was an over-25s night. It was known by those that visited as having a large number of married people who went without the knowledge of their partners. It was speculated that this may have been why Patricia had decided not to tell her parents where she was really going that night. It could have also been that she'd simply changed her mind on an impulse. While this was its reputation amongst the older members of Glasgow society, the younger people enjoyed the Barrowlands, and it provided an escape from what was for many a hard and difficult life. The Barrowlands was always busy, and this made it difficult for police to pin down what Patricia had done that night and who she may have been with. Police distributed the information about Patricia's murder to the newspapers, which ran the story. People were concerned about what had happened to her, and the fact that a woman's naked body was discovered just yards away from her home was a shock to many. When the information was distributed to the public, it was hoped that someone would have that key piece of evidence that would provide the police with their first real lead. Despite the coverage that the murder received in the newspapers and the interest that was surrounding Patricia's murder, information was not as forthcoming as the police had hoped. Tips did come in, but nothing that could be linked concretely to the murder. Unfortunately, some parts of Patricia's story were focused on more than the details of her murder. The fact that Patricia had been to Barrowlands the night before meant that some people unfairly judged her. Some believed that Patricia, as a married woman, should not have been going to the ballroom alone, and unfortunately, during the 1960s, there was more of an expectation that women would stay at home. Some people openly criticised her for going out, and almost suggested that Patricia had brought it on herself. This was obviously an antiquated and horrific way to talk about a victim. However, unfortunately, these opinions have not just stayed in the 1960s. Women's roles were much different during this time, and the Barrowlands' reputation did not compel people to come forward to help. The fact that so many people attended the Barrowlands also didn't help, as there were so many possible suspects, it made it hard for the police to narrow them down. There was another problem with the investigation, and that was the crime rate in Glasgow at the time. Patricia's murder, although horrific and incomprehensible, was not rare for the city, 
The crime rates in Scotland had been on the rise during the 1960s, and murder was more commonplace than it should have been. The Herald has since reported that in 1965 alone, 850 men were arrested for carrying weapons, including knives, razors, hatchets and swords. Violence was not unusual, and fights, assaults, sexual attacks and murder happened relatively frequently in the city. This rise in crime rates went hand in hand with a loss of jobs, poor housing and health and access to alcohol. Therefore, when Patricia was murdered, it meant that, while people were still shocked by the circumstances, they weren't as surprised as people in other cities may have been. Many people went about their business as usual, and the number of people heading to the ballrooms and out and about at night remained the same. It didn't affect many people's day-to-day behaviour. Society at the time also played a role in this, as sadly violence towards women was not always seen to be as important, and therefore didn't get the prominence that it should have done in the media. Newspapers did continue to report on any movement in Patricia's case, and continued to appeal for witnesses and tips, however there were few updates to report. Police had still not found any more of Patricia's belongings and couldn't narrow down who she may have met that night at the Barrowlands Ballroom. They had some information to go on about the type of person that may have committed this. They could speculate that whoever it was may have known the area, that they may have met her at the ballroom. They also suspected that they took her clothes and dumped her handbag in the river. There was one element of the crime scene that confused all of the officers. While the suspect had stripped Patricia naked and taken her belongings, they had left one thing behind with the body. Patricia had been menstruating at the time of the murder, and the offender had made a strange decision. He had left her soiled sanitary pad next to the body which seemed like a deliberate action. What exactly this meant was unclear, but this element of Patricia's murder would come to be much more significant in the years to come. The murder featured in many newspapers and was well documented in the Glasgow area, but despite this, nothing was found to suggest who the perpetrator was, and unfortunately her case began to disappear from the front pages. In a city as busy and as dangerous as Glasgow was at the time, it didn't take long for new stories to overtake Patricia's. Many people had sadly formed the opinion that she'd been out partying without her husband that night, and due to this, something awful had happened to her. As wrong as that assumption was, public opinion often influences how much attention a case gets. Patricia's family continued to mourn her loss and the occasional small headline would pop up about the unsolved murder, but time passed. It wasn't until 18 months later and another murder that the people of Glasgow and the police began to realise that something wasn't right and that they had a predator stalking their streets and one that blended into their community. Patricia's murder suddenly didn't seem like such a random attack, and perhaps another part of a tragic mystery. Thank you for listening to part one of this three-part series. Thank you to Podcom for sponsoring this episode. Browse sponsorship opportunities now using the link in the show notes. While you're in the show notes, head over and have a listen to Eastern Crime Zone. The next episode will be out in a week, but if you want to hear the episode now before it's out, it's currently up on Patreon, so head over and have a look at what we offer, including stickers, shoutouts, early and ad-free access, plus monthly bonus episodes voted by you. Thank you as always to our patrons, the link is in the show notes. If you'd like to support the podcast further, then please leave us a review wherever you listen, which now includes Spotify, or subscribe on our YouTube channel. You can also just tell someone else about the podcast or recommend it on social media. I always love hearing your opinions. You can also send in any case suggestions over there, or at my email address, theunseenpod at gmail.com.
I will see you here again next week for part two. Until then, I'm Caprice and this has been Unseen.